The following podcast contains alcohol-enhanced conversations about alcohol, as well as the potential for the discussion about topics of dubious, disturbing, possibly offensive, but usually hilarious interest. The opinions stated herein are solely of the persons making them, and any endorsement of these opinions by any other party is not implied. Foul language is likely, but intolerant viewpoints are not. Listener intoxication is advised. Hello and welcome to episode 41 of the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. And I'm Ed. And if you recall, over one year ago, we were forced to scrap some well-laid plans and hastily cobbled together our very first Scotch episode, episode number 23, in about a half an hour because of an imminent COVID quarantine going into effect in New Jersey. On that very day, we ended up comparing the Glenmorangie 10-year single malt Highland Scotch with its Speyside blended cousin, Monkey Shoulder, which yielded a fun episode, but one that we ultimately found to be unsatisfying from a whiskey knowledge standpoint. But tonight, we're hoping to right that wrong and simultaneously make up for lost time by doing something a bit deeper. Overdoing something, I would say. Oh, yeah. Overdoing. (laughs) You'll see. Uh, And featuring the person and scotches that we had originally planned to have on that episode. So, toward that end, Ed's going to start us off by telling you which seven scotches we'll be tasting and the brand new guest with whom we'll be enjoying these scotches tonight. Thanks, Cobb. So, my friend Joe has joined us finally and he brought quite a collection with him i want to thank you for having me on it yes. is a year past when i was supposed to be on here. yes yes but covid ruined everything um, i'm looking forward to doing this tonight yeah uh, welcome to the podcast so great to have you and uh, i mean joe's been listening to our podcast for overall two years so mm-hmm. one of our original fans yeah um so scott and i went out we got the balvenie doublewood 12 year which we thought would be a nice you no know, next step for us and then um we left the rest of the work for joe joe brought <laughs> <laughs> two Glenlivets, a Glenlivet 12 year, which is what we thought he was going to bring to compare to our Balvany. They're both 12 years, and we can kind of see the difference between them and talk about where they're from and all. But then he surprised us by bringing us the Glenlivet 18, which mm. is just spoiling us, mm-hmm. which we're going to get a little kiss of that. Luckily, there's not too much of that, so we won't get really fired up. But then, <laughs> and the real super surprise, and what I'm really excited about, yes. since we feature the Glenmorangie original 10 year. Uh, make sure you pronounce it correctly. Glenmorangie. Glenmorangie. The Glenmorangie original 10 tenure on our first episode episode 23 joe's brought that again but we're looking to do a spectacular extension on the brand by doing the la santa the nectar door which basically means it's like their equivalent of nectar of the gods and right. then right. the premium bottle signet a 200 dollars plus bottle and it's a tremendous treat and joe's spoiling us rotten here today and so that's the seven scotches that we'll be sampling on this episode which is probably three more than would be prescribed by a sane person <laughs> completely unnecessary so this is scotch fest 2021 <laughs> Scott? Yes. We're gonna do <laughs> yes, the, Ed. we're gonna do the <laughs> the Balvenie Doublewood first. I have a description from their website. All right. And then I'll talk about the stats of it and right. we'll go right into the tasting of it. Later we'll do the Balvenie history of the distillery. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yep, please. We are ready. 2018 marked the 25th anniversary of the Balvenie Doublewood aged 12 years. This milestone is not only a testament to the craftsmen who have dedicated their working lives to make Balvany the handcrafted way, but to the skill of our malt master, David Stewart, and you're going to hear a lot about David Stewart. Just fair warning, they love him. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Who, throughout his 55-year career, has changed the face of Scotch, work which earned him an MBE, which means a member of the British Empire Award, in 2016. 
Doublewood 12 was launched in 1993 using a process designed by David Stewart in 1982, now commonly known as wood finishing. Ed, comments? (laughs) (laughs) Too many jokes! But really, there's nothing better than finishing off with your wood. With your wood, exactly. (laughs) Sometimes you get in the rough, you know, and you got to you, you can't use your wood, you know, you got to use like maybe like a rescue club. But uh, when you can finish with your wood, it's glorious when you're in the rough. <laughs> Love it. So whiskey that has spent at least 12 years in traditional whiskey casks, usually American oak, ex bourbon barrels, and moves it to Spanish oak, ex Oloroso sherry cask for an additional nine months. The whiskey is then transferred to large oak vessels called tons, T-U-N-S, for three to four months to allow the whiskeys to combine and gain a distinctive character with each stage lending different qualities to the resultant malt whiskey. The traditional casts soften and add delicate character. The sherry wood brings depth and fullness of flavor, spelled with a U, <laughs> and the final few months in our tons allow the whiskeys to marry harmoniously. It is a wood finished, as we said, single malt scotch, 100% malted barley, of course. Balvenie Distilling Company Limited, Dufftown, Scotland. The owner is William Grant and Sons. The proof is 80, and the age, of course, is 12 years. That's why it's 12. William <laughs> Grant and Sons, which, by the way, yes. appeared in our Fistful of Bourbon as the, um, yes. as the owner of the Texas Five Blended Bourbon. They put Monkey Shoulder out, too? They do. In fact. Yeah. So, there's a little tie from our first episode. Exactly. I as, know. Uh, as William and the Sons show up again. Yeah. Well, so, well, let's smell. Ooh. It smells very scotchy to me. Very scotchy. Not not the peaty, smoky no, scotch. No, but there's the, no peaty smokiness to this. No, there's just. So, what is it? What do I. It's just a barley I smell? The, yeah. The malted barley. You may also be smelling the. Peaches. Uh, Ol- I'm smelling peaches. The Oloroso, the sherry influence in it. Mm. Yeah. Peaches. Interesting. Interesting. So, oh, like so many fruits that I can't even separate them out. Wow. What is the uh, proof on this? 80? 80, yep. Hmm. It's a really nice nose. A it's tiny bit of grassiness. It's not overly no, earthy. Earth, yeah, a little, little earthy. It's a little bit, but it's not overly earthy like we expect some scotches to be. Correct. Joe, what are you getting on the nose of this? I'm telling you, I, sm- I smelled the peaches early. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But the uh, sherry cask, I can definitely, that's coming through. And that's what my taste has kind of gone to is like scotches that have been finished in the sherry cask. Yeah. Have you had this expression before? I have. You have had this before. Okay. I mean, I really like, I do definitely smell the peaches on the nose of this. I wouldn't buy this again. No, you don't like this? What, did you taste it? I just tasted okay. it. Okay. Um, it's not a bourbon, Ed. Um, no, but... <laughs> <laughs> the, this this is a man's drink. Um, it's um, I mean, you just put shade on a, on a whole lot of people out there, not just me. So we only do first names on the podcast, but I w- we'll put his full last name and uh, address in the comments <laughs> at the bottom. We're going to dox him is what you're saying? <laughs> We're just going to give out a contact information. All you have to do is send us an email. We'll give you his contact information. <laughs> and and it'll, it'll come with a free egg. You can start his house. <laughs> free oh. egg. <laughs> the toilet paper roll, too. Why not? That's right. With a whiskey tangent toilet paper roll, each little square has whiskey tangent. Yeah, one has my face on it, and the next one has Ed's. It's <laughs> mine and then Ed's. <laughs> right. So it's annoying in the morning. I have to rip every other uh, frame out and just wipe with Right. If you only like one of us you have to use every other sheet <laughs> so um let me I, I mean, by saying i wouldn't buy it again i don't like this as much as i liked either the glimmer energy or the monkey shoulder it's a little bit too scotchy for me mm. it's a little bit too of that aftertaste it's just not my cup of tea i think it's a very good scotch I taste the complexity and I can smell the fruits, but I don't taste anything except that scotch aftertaste. Yeah, so we have not had a whole lot of scotches. We've maybe done a half dozen on the podcast so far. Uh, you really need to have this flavor in your mouth for a long period of time and several different iterations of it to appreciate it, just, I think, like bourbons and rice. So, Joe, on the taste, what are you getting? Um, with me, I like to have my scotches with a cigar, and it just reminds oh. me of like, I'm getting that, like, Interesting. Cigar taste for some reason. Maybe it's just a memory of drinking this before, sitting out on my, <laughs> on my back patio. So you're getting, with, you're getting memories of... You have memories uh, yeah. of cigar notes. Hey, did you put water in yours? I haven't. Okay. We have our fancy right. new distilled water eyedroppers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It opens up a little bit more of the sweetness and less of the barley character that I think, Ed, that is turning you off. I think it's a fine scotch. Um, there's some scotches that are sweet enough, Irish whiskey enough for me to like them, like I think the Monkey Shoulder, but I think most people who are devout scotch drinkers don't really like Monkey Shoulder. 
I mm-hmm. just recently had monkey shoulder. And yeah, do you like listening it? to the podcast? I, I went out and bought the monkey shoulder, and I have to be honest, I I did not particularly care for that. Mm. And my wife, I, I just passed it off to her, and she's drinking that. And yeah, she loves it, and she's not a Scotch drinker. So, so our, she's the bourbon drinker. Our, our first episode that we did, we kind of build it as two scotches that you might like if you were a bourbon drinker, and the Glenmorangie ten year and the monkey shoulder absolutely are. This one, I taste. Um, a lot of oak. There's a real like sharp yes. oak flavor uh, yes, to it. Yes, I can taste that oak. Yeah, and it's called double wood, so it's not really shocking well, that I, it has. I, a, it's not shocking. That's I mean, true. just be honest. It's got it's two different barrels. You yeah, used. and and maybe that's why you don't like it because it, maybe it's just too much oak for you. Well, maybe it mixed with the way that the uh, barley hits. To quote Thomas Hayden Church from the movie Sideways, <laughs> it, it it tastes good to me. Yeah. <laughs> so on the nose we have smells like peaches. Look at that. Yeah, that comes right up front. Yeah, marzipan, cedarwood, and pine. Marzipan. Huh. What does marzipan like smell like? It's an almond, almond paste. It's German, and they don't know anything about scotch anyway, so F I, I think a little bit sweeter than an almond. Yeah, it's like a sugary dessert thing. Yeah. Uh, honeydew melon. A drop of water tames the alcohol fumes and releases a ghost of heather, clover, and mown grass. Mm, yeah, see, I, yes. this is a ghost of sadness on me. <laughs> ghost of sadness. Uh, on the palate, heavy with vanilla and woodiness. Mm. complemented by a toothy mouthfeel <laughs> flavors of freshly baked sugar cookies no caramel no and marshmallow no the sherry oak presence steamrolls in yes along yes. with notes of heather and farm stand honey but the result is a solid silky whiskey reminiscent of a bourbon mm. no yeah i'm not agreeing with that i'm not agreeing, I'm not, I'm not this agreeing is with the scotch bourbon guy in scotland who thinks he knows what bourbon this is scotchnoob.com uh interestingly the sherry flavor itself usually a dominant presence in sherry whiskey is light here yes. and in the background agreed contributing only some dark plum and peach flavors <laughs> a few drops of water brings out some floral accents without diminishing the powerhouse oak powerhouse oak i mean yeah. Yes. I'm yes. laughing at, at plum comic because Joe said off air, like, <laughs> who really can taste plum? It's a right. fucking it's, very it's, subtle it's very, flavor. G- very generic. And then oh. sure enough, there's a first tasting that we have is plum. All right. So what do you guys think of the finish? I, I'm finished now, so I'm happy. <laughs> and it's finished. Kind of, it goes away pretty fast. Like it kind of, yeah. It, it it comes and goes away. There's not a long lingering finish to this. Yeah, uh, there, I think there's less oak on the finish than there is on the immediate it, palate because it, right. it's when so oaky. But it, I did put water on this, and it kind of like fades. I also added some water, and I typically don't do that to my scotches. Yeah. They say the finish is medium long, relying heavily on the wood accent, some caramel apple, blackstrap rum, toasted clove, cinnamon, and red wine tannins. Red wow. wine tannins. Is, is, is that kind of what you're getting? Because the sherry really isn't a presence in this. It's the oak, and it's hard to get past that. Overall, I like it. I'm not sure I would buy it again. In fact, I think I've had the Balvenie. I'm not sure I've had the Balvenie Double Wood, this one in particular, but I've had one of them before, maybe like at a bar, and I just found it okay. I liked it. It was fine. I didn't regret buying it, but I don't think I'd get it again. I have actually just recently repurchased this. I, Did you? I bought this six or seven years ago, mm-hmm. and I remember enjoying it and just bought this five days ago. Oh, wow. So you do like it. I do like it. <laughs> Ed does not. Ed is on his phone and ignoring all of us. He's being a millennial right now. I'm. <laughs> it's not a bad scotch. I can identify what makes it a good scotch, but it just isn't good for me. And I'm okay with that. And Scott, do you like this? I'm trying to think if I like this better than the two scotches we did previously, and I don't think right. I do. I think I like the Glen Warren G Tenure, and I like the Monk Shoulder better than this because this is a pretty right. intense I think, scotch. I think we have a trade with Joe. Yeah, it's just I was just thinking <laughs> think, that myself. Going, how can, am I going to work yeah. out a way where I can trade my Glen Warren G Tenure? That's a win for you. That's a step yeah. up for you, Joe. It's a win. Yeah, it's it's absolutely yeah, a win. We'll, for me. we'll make that happen. We'll, we'll do some bartering off air, no doubt. <laughs> All right, because right, so, we have a lot of whiskeys to say. But so I have a history. Yeah. Uh, so the history is pretty short, and I couldn't find a more in-depth history. It's, it was kind of strange, but here it goes. In 1892, following the creation just six years earlier of his first distillery called Glenfiddich, William Grant built the Balvany Distillery in an abandoned 18th century mansion known as the Balvany New House, with whiskey production commencing on May 1st of the following year. In 1923, William Grant passed away, and his son John began the first expansion of the distillery. Fast forward to 1962, and a 17-year-old David Stewart joined the company, becoming malt master just 12 years later in 1974. 
At the, 29? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Their first single malt called Balvenie was released just three years earlier, but it wasn't until 1983 that Stewart began experimenting with different wood maturation, known as finishing today, with the first bottling of such experimentation called Balvenie Classic. In 1987, they released a 50-year-old whiskey, one of the oldest in the industry, and in 1990, sister distillery Kinnanvy began its operations as the third Grant & Sons distillery in the town of Dufftown. In 1993, Balvany released three new single malts, the 10-year reserve, the 12-year double wood that we have tonight, and the 15-year single barrel. And thanks to natural alchemy and centuries-old craftsmanship, the Balvany is unique among single malts as their whiskey-making process is dedicated to maintaining the five rare crafts. Number one, Balvany claims to be the only distillery in Scotland that still grows its own barley. Mm. They are one of the few distilleries who still use traditional floor malting, they have their own coppersmith on site for maintaining their stills. They have their own cooperage on site for making barrels. And they have the longest serving malt master in history, Dave Stewart. <laughs> Dave Stewart, not to be confused with the guy from the Rivers, right? That's true. <laughs> Thus, it is no surprise today that Balvenie puts out 27 different expressions, including the six scotches in their core lineup, but not including 25 additional whiskeys, collectively called the DCS Compendium, each of which celebrates... David Stewart, his long tenure at Balvenie and his unique and widespread contributions to the world of scotch. Wow. They have 52 expressions. 52 expressions. Total. You can't, it's you insane. Can't, you can't call them lazy. <laughs> no, you can't. So that's Balvenie. All right, Balvenie. Thanks right. so much for showing up, Balvenie. And uh, we're going to trade you to Joe for the Glenmorangie. And we're going to make like a football draft day thing. Well, a whiskey to be named later. All right. So we're going to take a quick <laughs> break. And we're going to uh, wash the glasses and get ready for the next scotch, which will be the Glen Livets. The Glen Livets. And then we'll ask Joe, how the fuck do you get in the scotch? So the glasses are all cleaned up, and uh, we have poured the two Glenlivets. We have the 12-year and the 18-year. Mm. I mean, you know, you have to think about when you're drinking an 18-year-old expression. And this one, actually, I think it's been sitting around the house for, for about two years with Joseph. So it's really a 20 years. <laughs> oh, it, it's been longer than that. Right, so, well, wow. I'm just saying. I, I take a while to drink my scotch. Well, he has I a lot of them. enjoy them. Joe's someone that is similar to me, unlike Scott. <laughs> Scott has a lot of whiskeys around the house because of the podcast. But deep down inside, he usually never really has more than four or five bottles he's actively drinking. It's fair. I have 36 bottles in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't drink one unless you have a backup. I won't. I, yeah. I do, but it's uncomfortable, and I will put it's it. Uncomfortable. I will put it away when I have half of it left, and I won't touch it till I get another bottle. Right. Because I don't want to run out of it. It's insanity. Right. Once I get below half, I stop drinking it until I. I okay. So you put the money right. aside. You're literally halfway so, between yes, us. Yes. <laughs> like I still have some of the Blantons from our Blanton short, which was like a million years ago. I feel oh my like God, that was November. Right. I think. I still have some of that because I couldn't get another bottle of Blanton's yet, so I simply won't kill that bottle until I get other Blanton's. And we all know how hard that is. So. Um, that's true. Yeah. As hard that's as what it, she said. Right. As, <laughs> sorry. It's harder than a boy in prom night. So. <clears throat> the, um, harder than a boy in prom night. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, so they couldn't live it. <laughs> right. So the, the 12 and the 18, uh, I've heard about them a lot. They're very popular. Nothing tonight is obscure. No. We know that the majority of our fans are bourbon and rye drinkers like we are, but we know we have a lot of Scotch people out there that tolerate us or tune in for the <laughs> bourbon and, yeah. you know. And that's how Ed I started just recently, within the past year, started getting dabbling into the bourbons. Why, yeah. don't, why don't you give us your origin story now? We've talked on here about how we got into bourbons. Like, what made you jump over the American whiskeys and go all the way across the pond? Tell us how you got into scotch. Well, I mean, it started early, Ed. I mean, the first four years, you're drinking nothing but milk, and then you get in the <laughs> kindergarten, and dad goes... Uh, all of a sudden, the whiskey house shows up. Right. No. Now, I will say, um, my, my buddies and I, we, we do a Phillies trip every year. 2012, we do a Phillies trip in Denver, Colorado, and we have, I don't know, eight to ten people going, and they decide we're going to go to a speakeasy. Mm. And mm. I'm like, what the hell is that? I never drank 
any liqueur whatsoever. Right, you were a beer guy. You oh, actually made your own beer I for made years. My own, I made my own beer, and I didn't need anything other than the beer. Right. I was brewing that. It was great. We go to the speakeasy. We go down there. They go, oh, you just tell them what type of drinks you like, what type of bourbons, what type of scotch. I go, well, I don't drink any of that. <laughs> and I go, um, since I don't drink any bourbon, scotch, whiskeys, I'll, I'll have a beer and... They had maybe like two or three different beers to choose from, and it, it was a miserable night. So I decided, well, I need to stop being a wuss, and I got to step up, <laughs> oh, and right. yeah, I need to start drinking. May so not, may not, like, bro. But I'm like, what am I going to start drinking? Do right. I do I do bourbon? Where do you start? Do I do scotch? It was funny. I come back and I'm watching a movie, and I'm not going to recommend the movie, but it will <laughs> it will say the, the Family Man with Nicolas Cage. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. It's a, what would life be like? Got you. So, Nicolas Cage wakes up one morning, and instead of having his girlfriend in his wonderful car, he's got a wife in the minivan. <sighs> so, he's talking to the head of the company where he was working for when he was a single guy making all this money. Okay. And he turns to the guy and goes, you drink bourbon, but you offer your clients scotch. So, I'm like, well, that's interesting. He continues the conversation. And he turns to the guy second in command and he goes, you like expensive things. He says something about his nice car and, and the types of cigars he smokes. And then he says, you're a single malt scotch guy. Mm. And I go, at that moment, crazy, just watching this movie. At that moment, I go, I'm going to start drinking scotch. Okay. And that was the, for me, the perceived more elite drink. And it is to many and, people. And it's perceived. Yeah. Perceived. No, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not, not making, worldwide. Yeah. So Lincoln Financial Field is yeah. hosting the 2012 Whiskey Fest. Where the Eagles play. Where the Eagles play. Go Eagles! Fly, Eagles, fly, on the road to victory. So I wound up that night going in there with my friends, and I wound up tasting probably 30 to 40 different types of scotches. And my first Fun night. that night, my <laughs> first bottle of scotch that I came home with was yeah. the Ardbeg Ooh. Supernova. Oh, and holy Ed, shit! Ed oh. has experienced yeah, that. I did, and I still have that. And here it is, nine <laughs> years later. I still have that original bottle. And nine years later, you can still taste the smoke from that bottle. So yes. right now, <laughs> I, I will tell. I will tell my experience. That was. I had no idea what I was getting into. Wait, Ed, is this your Ardbeg story? Yes. Oh yes. Jesus. I mean, yes. It's actually you could call it my first bottle of scotch too. Yeah. Though. So I was over at Joe's house and I said, "Give me something that's really unique that I've never had in the Scotch world." And so we poured me like a small dram of the Ardbeg. It snapped my head back when I smelled. It. I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> fuck is this?" Like, <clears throat> and so I drank it and. All I can say is this: I've never had anything more terrible in my mouth. It was like it was like paper. No, but it was like grass on fire, on fire. <laughs> dipped in paint thinner, and I swallowed it. And when I swallowed it, there was relief. But then this is a true story. There's so much complexity in Narbeg that my mouth almost missed it. As much as I hated it, but now it's gone. And now my taste buds have nothing to battle over. Like <laughs> so I completely recognized the complexity to it. And I did spend the rest of the night trying to get that fucking aftertaste out of my mouth. But yeah. he did ask for a second taste. Yeah. I did. I had to experience it one more time because I'd never experienced anything like an Arbeg. And I mean, like there's a big joke online about the Arbeg nation and Arbeg disciples and yeah, cult. Yeah, the cult of Arbeg. <laughs> and, and that's why it's still nine years later, I still have that original, my first bottle of scotch you is still, still have on the my bottle. bar yeah there's not much left should have brought it there's no way your wife lets oh, you kiss I, her the night my, you drink that my shit. children don't even want to be in the same room with me when i have my glass mm. of ardbeg supernova well you have very intelligent children so that makes sense <laughs> well they're, yeah they're they're, both, they don't take after me they take after my wife they're both incredibly bright people yeah my, my first uh, really smoky scotch experience was with lafroy yes. and it was at this place in philly after work, we went to happy hour. I think it might have been called the Boilermaker because they made Boilermakers, which is okay. just a shot and a beer. Right. So they had a certain menu of scotches, maybe six or seven. And, and then on the other side, a certain set of beers that you could have them with. But they were paired already. So the beer that I wanted was paired with Lafroy. And I had no idea at the time what, <laughs> what whiskeys or scotches, I had no idea. Wow. So I got the whatever the beer it was that I wanted with the Lafroy. I'm like, okay, I can do this. And I, I do the shot. And I start sipping the beer and suddenly the smoke hits me. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. It's like somebody stuffed 
a, a cigar burnt stick down my throat. We had more beers later and then we had dinner later and all I could still taste the entire night and the next morning was that smoke. It was ridiculous. And I was like, fuck scotch. Fuck it. Fuck it to hell. And, and here I am on a scotch episode on a podcast. Uh, and I kind of like it. <laughs> and, and that's where I started with that. I'm going all in. I'm buying scotches. Yep. And I yep. went with, like you said, the Ard bag. I have Lafroy. So you liked it right away, right? I you liked tasted it. it. Yeah. Well, I can't say I truly enjoyed mm. it. It was something I had a hankering for. Mm-hmm. You and that's really why still, wanted to like it. I wanted to, right. And, I, and then you did because a I, lot. Because I didn't want to be a wuss anymore. Right. I wanted right. something I can go out and order a, a glass of scotch. Right. But that's why I still have my Ardbeg Supernova. An Ardbeg Supernova. I'll dr- I'll, An Ardbeg Supernova in the sky. <laughs> I'll... I'll smoke one or two cigars a year. So on okay. one of those cigars, yeah. I will have my Ard bag with that. Well, and, yeah. And then sleep in the shed. The Ard bag is smokier than the cigar. <laughs> yes. Well, exactly. Yeah. The cigar actually improves your breath. And what's keeping me a scotch drinker mm-hmm. is my wife is a bourbon drinker. Right. And knowing that she despises scotches, <laughs> I know my Ard bag will still be there because she will not touch it. Well, if I go over, I would love to have just a little bit of it. Just for the experience of it. I yeah. should have brought that with me. You know what? I'll, I'll call my wife and maybe she'll bring it now. No. <laughs> she'll bring it right now? She'll bring it over? Yeah, right. You actually only live 12 minutes away. Right. That's true. Uh, all right. So we'll just transition right into the Glenlivet 12 year. This whiskey has been called a lot of things in its time. Smooth, fruity, complex, sophisticated, entertaining, classic, and possibly terrible by Ed. The, the original <laughs> malt whiskey almanac says, quote, a first class malt one of the most popular malts in the world, and deservedly so. Representing the Glenlivet's signature style, this classic malt is first matured in traditional oak before spending time in American oak casks, which imparts notes of vanilla and gives the whiskey its distinctive smoothness. The mineral-rich water that comes from Josie's Well, a nearby natural spring, helps form the flavors during mashing and fermentation, whilst the specific height and width of the copper stills add a delicate yet complex character. Keep a bottle on hand, for every occasion. Oh, come on in. Hey, what's up? This is Joe. Hello. Hi, Joe. Ed's friend, Joe. What do you know? <laughs> Joe, what do you know? I know Ed and I know Scott. Oh, see. That's and now you know Siobhan. Yeah, I now know Siobhan. All right, so uh, let's taste the 12 year. You Absolutely. guys have been smelling it already. I don't oh, know. I've been smelling both of them. Oh, very, oh, very fruity. Oh, fruity. Um, I'm, I'm getting the green apples. I'm getting apple. Oh, yeah. Ab- absolutely apple. Getting a little apricot. Any oh, hint of plum? A hint of plum. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm getting a hint of I'm plum. I'm getting a little yeah. orange uh, marmalade. It's in a basket in a field and with a pie. Oh, God, I wanted to like this. <laughs> it started out so good. It's so sweet and delicious it in the beginning. It smells very sweet. And the first flavor is, and then it ends scotchy. Yes. So I got to try it again. But yes. it was, the finish is not my I, cup of tea, I, I, but much better on the palate. As I tasted it, I was like, it is not going to enjoy this. Mm. Hmm. It's so dry at the end, though, isn't it? It is very dry. It dries your tongue. It just sucks all the moisture off it. Yeah, it's Astringent. Maybe, you're 100% right on that. It's like... It's like, remember the old cartoons when we were a kid where they would like make them suck in a handful of talc or something? And oh, yeah. And they're like, alum? Oh, alum. Or, yeah, alum. That's alum. Right, alum. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I don't know what alum is to this day, but I know that in cartoon world, it made your face shrivel up. Yeah. They, you still use it in baking, I think, for some purpose. Yeah. Wow. Um, I don't like this. Tastes good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Hayden Church, ladies and gentlemen. So, Joe, I want to encourage you a little bit to try to... Name some flavors that, like, right. well, why do you like it? You're the scotch guy. Well, it, it, I, guess I, I don't want to put real, you on the I'm spot. Not a sweet, like, no. yeah, going back to the bourbon, that's that sweet drink. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing sweet about this at all. Uh, just a little bit on the nose and very, just, very, like, just, just a splash on a the palate. Hint, yeah. Right as soon as it touches your tongue, you, and then you it taste turns it. really earthy so, and as grassy. Ed said, it turns it right into that yeah. scotchy yeah. flavor. But I've trained myself over the, the last nine years. I trained myself. That's what I want. It's given me exactly what I'm expecting from interesting so from a scotch drinker's perspective this is really good to you yes i'm enjoying this immensely yeah so for me and they possibly for ed it's like sugar grass earth dry yeah and i'm gonna say that you know this reminds me of Mm -hmm. james e pepper rye oh 
it's almost the equivalent of that in the Scotch world. It's a very dry, but mm-hmm. it's kind of devoid of sweetness with a very alum like finish. <laughs> Yeah. When I say I don't like it, I'm I'm not saying that I hate it, but I just don't really enjoy this taste and I wouldn't seek it out again. And I can't give you a flavor that like (laughs) what comes out that why I'm enjoying it. It's just that typical scotch flavor that I enjoy. As you say, like my glass is empty. It really is. So let's say on the, if this is again from Scotch Noob on the nose, a limited range of sharp and herbal notes, not silky or caramel like, but rather grass, hay and green apple. Holy shit. We did pretty good, actually. There is an undertone of sugar and butter like stale shortbread cookies. On the palate, there is cereal grain brightness to the flavor developing out of the initial burn with notes of vanilla spices and brown sugar. It is reminiscent of hot oatmeal with brown sugar and cinnamon. Mm, I disagree totally with that. There is a dry note as well, Mm -hmm. Uh, like a corn syrupy sweetness instead of a malty one, but it's pleasant nonetheless. The finish is medium length with more cinnamon that rounds out the earlier flavors, but doesn't lessen the experience. I mean, I agree with, with I agree with sort of half of that. I found out that there are 6 million bottles of Glenlivet sold annually. 6 million. So they do okay. I mean, oh, that's yeah. nothing compared to what a Jameson does, mm-hmm. but or a Jack Daniels or a Crown Royal. This is something I was just having a conversation. Uh, I was at my family for, uh, I have a bunch of birthdays in May. My dad and both my brothers are all born in May. So we have like this one big party for all of them. So I don't have to see them that often. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a dick. Anyway, my dad was saying that he actually drank Glenlivet like in his 30s when he worked for some company and there was an older guy who was his mentor or something and that guy was almost an alcoholic and he he would really drink Glenlivet. So this was what my dad actually drank. Wow. But my dad's not a huge drinker or anything. Like I think he was just drinking to kind of belong. He was kind of like you. Yeah. <laughs> I want I, I I to feel like I belong to, to some group. Right. Uh, I don't know. Joe likes it, but I don't think it and I really uh, like it. A thumbs up thumbs up here i feel like we're in manly scotch world and we're just not measuring up today well i think it's easier oh, for me as a scotch drinker to transfer and move into bourbons i think it'd be very difficult for a bourbon drinker to start expanding their taste buds into to the you're saying this dry barley earthy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. scotch yeah right it's not for everybody all right so Ed, what are you doing? Are you right? Yeah, I was trying to see. I couldn't find how much Balvany were sold annually, but oh. we're going to try the uh, 18 years, see if it's any improvement. So before we taste this, I have a short description. Over the course of 18 years, our master distiller, Alan Winchester, takes this expression through a combination of cask types, including both first and second fill American oak for tropical fruitiness and oh. ex-sherry oak for spicy complexity. The results of this deft navigation of the distilling arts is a gorgeous single malt that is complex yet elegant and balanced. The 18-year-old has won more awards than any other expression. Every bottle is a true example of the quality and taste of the Glenlivet. Any bottle deserves pride of place in your cabinet, perhaps to be held back for a fitting occasion. It is, after all, crafted to impress. Smell it. 18. I'm still drinking the 12. I don't, I don't, I don't I, hate it. I, I will say it. the 12 had more aroma than the 18. Interesting. I don't know what I'm smelling here, but. Ooh, oh, so. Um, so it's the uh, same match bill, of course. It's just old. Yes. Six years older. Okay. Oh, actually, it's higher proof. The proof of the Glenlivet 18 is 86. Oh. Wow, 86. I actually, I actually really like the nose. I, I like the nose better I on like the 18. It's delicious. Than I do smelling. on the 12. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sweet. Apples, yeah, a you're little gonna, bit of a little bit of of wood. So fruity on the smell, so sweet. Yeah. Um, it, it smells incredible. Much yeah. less of the barley spice that you got oh, on yes. the twelve year. Much less of the grassy notes. Oh, this is much more palatable than the. So we're tasting. Good. We're tasting. I taste it. I still don't love it because it's still mm. Glenlivet, but. This is much better than the first one. I get one. so much peaches on the flavor of this one. Wow, this one I get peaches. So much better. Okay. It, and I don't really like peaches, but it's fun to get it in something else that's not peaches. It's juicy. That is very, very good. This is much better than the 12-year. It, it's, it's been a while. I, I told you, it, it takes me a while to drink my scotches. Yeah. This 18 is spectacular. Ed, so much better than the 12, right? Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, I know now to spend the $27 and get the 18-year Glenlivet if I have to get it out somewhere and not just the $18 12-year, which whatever it would cost. Yeah, this is quite good. Wow, mm. what a difference six years makes. It's a and huge it, difference. And, and only yeah. six points higher proof. Yeah, 
I killed mine because I was yeah. just dying to get a oh buzz my, on. Oh my he god! He just wanted to start drinking something. Something. Oh my god, guys! I just looked at the taste notes. Wait, <laughs> do you hear the nose? Ready? I honest to god, first nose note, hint of plum. <laughs> <laughs> hint of plum, but otherwise little sherry influence. Some vanilla, but not much wood. Where's the green apple? On the palate, nice thick body, creamy, not oily, golden raisins, fresh green figs, and sugar cookies. Finish, not as smooth as I have thought for this age. Vanilla again, and some small amount of bitterness. And the single yeah. word, anise. Anise. Wow. Ed loves anise. He does. He can't get enough anise. I really love it. Right, Siobhan? I have to keep my anise away from Ed. <laughs> Siobhan's like, what? I'm not involved. I love her anise. Oh, my God. Well, that's what I meant. It's, <laughs> Why am I surprised? It's been a while since I've had my Glenlivet 18, and this is spectacular. Uh, this is great. I really like this. This is the best scotch that we've tried tonight. Yeah. Of the three that we've absolutely. had. Absolutely. Right, that's right, not, right. Even, not even doing oh. No. If that's what we're doing, then yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that, that, absolutely. That, that is yes. what we're doing. Of the three tonight, yes, this is by yes. far. <laughs> okay, maybe it's a low bar. but No, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's an 18-year. Uh, what, what does this cost, an 18-year? Yeah. It was a gift. I don't know, Ed. Oh, well, we'll find out real quick. We'll have to look that up. Right. Uh, right now. I got it. Well, all right. While you're looking up the prices, I'll do the Glenlivet history. The remote and isolated Livet Valley made it ideal for illicit distillation. This is where founder George Smith learned his craft. Hidden away from the customs officers and soldiers amongst the hills and abundant springs, George had time to distill slowly, making a whiskey that would soon become world-renowned. In August 1822, King George IV arrived in Scotland for a state visit and asked to try a drop of the infamous Glenlivet whiskey. An illegal dram it was, but that didn't stop the king. It's good to be the king. Two years later, in 1824, after a change in legislation, George saw his window of opportunity to get licensed and become the first legal distiller in the parish of Glenlivet. This didn't go down well with the illicit distillers around him, and he was told he would burn along with his distillery. Damn. In a bid to protect himself from these sinister smugglers, he carried a pair of flintlock pistols with him at all times, making it clear he wasn't afraid to use them. Unless he gets attacked by three people. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Throw him. <laughs> right. His courage set the foundation for our whiskey today. By the late 1830s, the Glenlivet Distillery was producing more than 200 gallons a week, and by 1852, the reputation had spread beyond the green hills of Scotland to the smoky skies of London. Oh, wow. When Charles Dickens wrote to his friend urging him to try the rare old Glenlivet. He was recommending a single malt that went beyond his great expectations. <laughs> <laughs> With the passing of George Smith on November 27th, 1874, the job of continuing his life's work fell to his youngest son, John Gordon Smith, who had been training for a career in law, but returned to pick up the reins of the business. And just in time, too, because competitors were desperate to take the name Glenlivet for themselves to capitalize on its popularity. John fought hard against these usurpers and in 1884 found the solution in a small but powerful three-letter word, rechristening the distillery and their whiskeys as THE Glenlivet. And if you look on their bottles today, that's what it says. Like the, the Miami University. Yeah, right. The Ohio State. <laughs> exactly. When John's second great nephew, Captain Bill Smith Grant, took over the distillery in 1921, he was met by two challenges, the Great Depression and Prohibition in the United States. <laughs> But as a decorated war hero from World War I, Captain Bill rose to meet these challenges head on. As Prohibition came to an end, Americans came forward, thirstier than ever, for fine single malts. And thanks to Captain Bill's perseverance through the Depression, Glenlivet was in the perfect place to serve them their drams. Their first major customer was the Pullman Train Company, who began serving miniature bottles of Glenlivet on their routes, helping to spread their whiskey across the continents. So I guess they were called train bottles then, right? Instead of airplane bottles? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. Yeah, isn't that cool? An interesting fact is that Robert Lincoln, who was Abraham Lincoln's oldest son, uh -huh. was a president of the Pullman oh, was Coach he? Company. Maybe he made the deal. I mean, he might have been involved in that deal. Cool. Wow. So the second turn of the century saw another vast expansion of the distillery, this time by current master distiller Alan Winchester, who had spent 40 years honing his craft and was just the man to ensure that the spirit of their founder lived on. So today, Glenlivet continues to follow George Smith's original vision to break traditions, set new standards, and move things forward, with 27 different expressions utilizing both exceptional casks and different finishes like French oak, sherry, rum, and cognac in order to deliver unique pours and bases for cocktails, opening up the world of single malt scotch whiskey to everyone. 
27 expressions. Uh -huh. When I'm standing there in the liquor store, <laughs> I don't see 27 expressions of Glenn Livin. No, they have their core expressions and they have a lot of limited releases and like older expressions that are probably hidden in a cabinet because they're too expensive. Wait, Wait. is 150 possible for this? Wow. I mean, it's coming up total wine, 149. 144 somewhere else, 168 somewhere else, which is insane. It wasn't my money. I, my mother in law bought it for me. Oh. So, yes, she would spend 150 on it. Okay. Oh, hey, right. what a wonderful mother in law you have, too. You oh. always talk so highly about I her. I talk highly of my mother in law, yeah, yeah. my wife, my kids. I, yeah, I'm all blessed. the time. All the time. Wow. Scott, it's, I am blessed. Yeah. You are. What a lovely family you have, Joe. Well, you know, there's only a little bit left. I mean, we should just finish it off. Right. For, yeah. For, this Christmas, I'll just tell my mother in law I need a bot another think, bottle of Glenn Logan right. 18. Joe, please do the honors and pour the rest of it out in our Glen Cairn yeah. glasses. Siobhan, you want to taste the 18 you know to compare it to the 12 that you've already had? She's in the green room. That's the 18. Yeah. Yeah, she just comes out of the green room and gets the whiskey goes back in. All right, so we got three down and now the part, three of, down. The part I've been looking forward to all week. And the party's going to be started. The extension of the Glenmorangie. 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 I think we're going to drop Billy Cox in right here saying it. <laughs> Brian Cox. All right. Well, yeah. I, you act like I went to college with him, Scott. Oh, you, Fucking, you, I've only heard him once today. We got my Cox in there. Right. Wow. Right. Siobhan, turn your back. We're gonna we're gonna pull out all our Cox. <laughs> <laughs> Winner takes home the signet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, look, the signet's already home. <laughs> So we're back, getting ready to do our Glenmorangie. Glenmorangie. From the extension on the brand that we did on our first episode, we have the originals back for us to try again, and then there's three uptick expressions. And before that, we're going to let Scott give you a very brief Scotch whiskey TED Talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on basically what it's about for people who have no idea about Scotch whiskey. And for those who are Scotch drinkers, you might still learn a thing or two. Enlighten us, Scott. Yeah. So we didn't really do much of this. Like I said in the intro, we kind of cobbled together our episode really quick. We didn't like talk about what Scotch is and what the rules are. And yeah, what, right. Last year, Tom Bob. Last year. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, they have um, five rules, six regions, and seven types. These are the five rules. One, must be made of only water and malted barley, plus optional cereal grains like corn. Number two, must be mashed, fermented, and distilled to no more than 94.8% alcohol by volume, matured in oak casks, not exceeding 700 liters for a minimum of three years in Scotland. Number three, must not contain any additives other than water and caramel coloring. Interestingly. Wow, you're allowed caramel coloring in you Scotch. Are, you are. Yeah, interesting. Oh, yeah. Did not know that. Yeah. Uh, number f yeah. Rule number four. Must retain the characteristics of its raw materials, production, and maturation methods. In other words, it must smell and taste like a whiskey. <laughs> <I'm so strange>. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a great rule? And rule number five. The last rule must be bottled at no less than 40% alcohol by volume or 80 proof is there something about that that keeps stuff from spoiling because that's the american rule as well or did america just get that from scotland uh, the 40 percent yeah. abv the 80 proof yeah. Uh, maybe yeah that that's a pretty ubiquitous whiskey proof level yeah absolutely so there are six regions. Some of these are disputed. Some say four, <laughs> some say five, some say six. On our original podcast, you said four regions. Yeah, so... Uh, They've through. discovered two more since Scott... Uh, <laughs> no, that's not true. ...found Google. No, but like I said, it's kind of disputed. And even though, like I just read a Whiskey Advocate, it's like these scotches kind of belie where they're supposed to be categorized in. Because again... It's just generalizations. Not every scotch from every region is going to taste the same. But in general, these are the six regions. Well, number one, Highland. The Highland area is the largest scotch region by size. These are the Glenmorangies that we're going to taste very soon. Because of this, it also produces a huge range of styles and flavor profiles, ranging from very sweet and malty to very dry. North Highland malts are usually lighter in body. West Highland malts are slightly smoky, yet still less peaty than nearby Isla. Distilleries of note are Baubler, Brora, Dalmore, Glenmorangie, Lach Lomond, and Royal Brachla. I'm totally overdoing it. It's like it. you're speaking in Klingon to me. <laughs> I am. Kaplach. Number two, Speyside. 
So these are the whiskeys that we had already tasted tonight on the podcast, the Alphany and the Glenlivet. The region gets its name from the River Spey, S-P-E-Y, which incidentally provides the water to many of the distilleries in the region. Over half of Scotland's distilleries are located in the Speyside region, accounting for nearly two-thirds of all Scotch production. This was the reason for it being considered its own region because it was once part of the Highland region. Oh. So it split off at some point. Uh, the scotches produced here are the sweetest that you will find in any other area of Scotland. Also in Speyside, you will be able to find many different scotches that are either light and floral or rich and sherried. The distilleries of note are Arwalor, which we wow. like the, oh, we like the, uh, uh, the yes, Abuna, yes. the Balvany, the Benriach, the uh, Craiglachy, <laughs> the Glenfiddich, Glen Moray, huh. Glen Roths, the Macallan, and the Speyburn. Okay, so number three region is the Island region. Many consider the Island region to be a middle ground between Isla and Highland Scotches, which makes sense considering it's designated as a subdivision of the Highland region, just as Speyside was. The area is made up of islands of Skye, Mull, Orkney, Iron, Jura, and Lewis. The whiskies produced here are seen to have a coastal taste, with more sweetness and less peatiness than those in Isla, but more so than other Scotch regions. The distilleries of note here are the Arran, Highland Park, Jura, and Talisker. I've seen Talisker. Oh everywhere. yeah, absolutely. Number four region is the Isla region, as spelled I-S-L-A-Y. This region scotch is defined by the dramatic sea climate that surrounds it. It is an island like those other islands, but it is a region unto itself because of its whiskey characteristics. Nicknamed Whiskey Island because of the concentrated number of distilleries found on the isle, the aptly named Isla scotches taste strongly of the sea, adding notes of brine and strong peaty flavors. If you're looking for an incredibly smoky scotch, the Isla region is the place to look Distilleries of note are Ardbeg, ah, Bowmore, yeah. ah. Brucolati, Lafroig, Lagavulin, and Lafroy. Wow. Yeah. That's all terrible. <laughs> if, if, uh, global warming is a terrible thing, but if the ocean should rise and, oceans rise, empires fall, and cover that island, my life would be better. Oh, it wouldn't be a tragedy to <laughs> All right, so number five, the lowlands, which are the southern part of Scotland. So if you've never heard of lowland scotch, it's probably because there are only three active distilleries left in the region. A stark comparison to the roughly 200 that were once pumping out whiskey. Wow. Produced in the southern part of Scotland, the scotches here are usually lighter, have grassy notes, and can be considered more delicate than other whiskeys. A great place to start if you've never had scotch before. Distiller is a note as Akintoshin, Glen Kitchy, and the King's Barn. Never had any of those. Yeah, we've had the Akintoshin. Actually, and it's why the Akintosh has its foot kind of in Irish whiskey because of uh, it's light, it's very light, and the region kind of steals a little bit from Irish techniques, yeah. Yeah, and the last region, uh, the sixth region, the Campbelltown. As with the Lowland region, the Campbelltown region was once home to many more distilleries than exists today. Now you'll only find, again, three operating distilleries. The scotches here are known for complex flavors and a slightly oceanic salty finish, similar to what you would find in the brininess of Islay scotches. Overall, though, Campbelltown is a good place to search for rich, robust whiskeys that are not necessarily smoky. The distilleries of note here are a Glengyle, Glen Scotia, and Springbank, none of which I've ever heard of. Wow. So the last thing we do is the seven types of scotch. So there's malt scotch. It's whiskey made of only malted barley and a pot still. Very simple. The single malt is malt whiskey from one distillery. That's all single malt is. Okay. Then there we have grain, whiskey made from malted or unmalted, cereal grains including wheat, corn, barley, and is typically made in a column still, not a pot still. Right. Number four, the single grain is grain whiskey from, again, one distillery. So single means just a single distillery, not a single grain. Even though it's called single grain, it's very confusing. Number five is a blend. This whiskey is a mixture of whiskeys from different distilleries, typically using both malt and grain whiskeys. Then you have your blended malts, which are just single malts from different distilleries. And then the blended grain, which is grain whiskeys from different distilleries. And that's it. That is your oh, that, that scotch all. primer. Everything's so clear now. <laughs> And I'm thirsty. I deserve a dram of uh, whatever the Glenmorangie that we're going to be drinking first. So according to the Glenmorangie Company, the earliest record of alcohol being produced on the site goes back to 1703. What? what? Um, but it was beer. False. They're a brewery. Okay. Until an official brewery was built in 1730s. And the former distillery manager, William Matheson, acquired the farm in 1843 and converted the Morangie Brewery to a distillery. The Morangie Brewery? Yep. Yeah, it was just Morangie. Gotcha. Equipped with two secondhand gin stills, he later renamed the distillery Glen Morangie, yeah. but 
like all of the distilleries that we've seen over the years, there's always ups and downs and changes. So you really don't get a continual product and ownership. Now, right. they claim that the original tenure, that recipe was produced over 175 years ago. Oh. That's what they say. Now, this tenure. This tenure. That we tasted before and we will taste again. That's sitting in our glass right now is supposedly the same recipe and the same product that they made 175 years ago. All right. But the reality is, the distillery was eventually purchased by their main customer, the leaf firm of McDonald and Muir, okay. in 1918. And they would retain control for 90 long years. Now, like all the distilleries in Britain, they suffered during the Depression and Prohibition. Right. And then they also shut down during the war years. But after the war, the company really became the company it is today in 1948. All right. And the water supply became a concern in the 1980s, so they bought 600 acres so no one could develop around their water supply, which was the same smart Tarlogi Springs uh, that they've always used. And then they expanded the 90s, and then they eventually were purchased in 2004 by Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton oh. for 300 million uh, yeah. euros, yeah, yeah. it looks like. Louis Vuitton, where you can get a free bag with your whiskey. <laughs> right. So they have a lot of expressions. Their core lineup is the original and La Santa, which mm-hmm. we're going to be trying today. Mm-hmm. The Quintin Ruban, Ooh. which we're not going to be trying today. No. The new product by them, X by Glenmorangie. Joe, why didn't you bring us these? I didn't know they existed. X is brand new. <laughs> it's $36 a bottle. It is priced to make cocktails with and only oh. cocktails. Oh. That is why it was made. That's what wow. they want you to do with it. Okay. Good, and then there's good, the good. Nectar Dior. Nectar Dior. Then in their prestige range, they have 18, 19, 25, the Signet, which we're going to try tonight, Pride 1981, Pride 1978, Whoa. Pride 1974. Whoa. That was whiskey that was barreled in 1974. Okay. It was bottled 40 years after that. There's 503 decanters, which sold for $9,700 each, I think. Jesus Christ. Um, that was highly... so, But you're buying 40-year-old scotch. Uh, I, I guess. Uh, 9700 They did 20 years in oak barrels and then they think they did another 20 years in sherry bottles Ooh, patience so oh, yeah patience wow. right yeah. so like the people who bottled them died pretty much probably <laughs> right if you're like a 50 year old like you know rick house worker you, you rolled that barrel in there and you went home and you died before that ever got bottled right you push it back into the rick and you're just like yeah. i am never gonna see this right so I'm, i feel i'm depressed i feel sad well i mean other people die for like nothing this person provided whiskey for the world i think their kids should be proud <laughs> so they have something called cake Ooh, a, i'd like uh, some a, cake yeah like a taste of cake or something and there's just too many names i'm not gonna go through. again like all these distilleries have so many expressions this past christmas my mother-in-law bought me glen morangi no you might say that no glen morangi and morangi glen morangi <laughs> extremely rare and i actually had tears in my eyes when oh. i'm opening this up wow and here we are what, what what's today june it's already gone <laughs> i I've, i finished that you in, you, in, you drank that in all less than six months well, well, well oh geez six months that's nothing six days bourbon around here so this is the most interesting story i found about glenn morangi no Glen Morangy. Oh, yeah, you're right. I did say it right I, for I, change, I, and you ruined it. I fucking said it right for the first time. Well, say it again. Random belligerence. Say it right twice in a row. I dare you. Edition. Glen Morangy. Very nice. Uses a number of different cast types, with all products being matured in white oak casts, which are manufactured from trees growing in their own forest in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri, United States. Oh, wow. These new casts are left to air for two years before being leased to distillers Jack Daniels and Heaven Hill for them to mature bourbon in for four years. Cool. Then Glimmerangie takes these barrels back to mature their own spirits. The original range will mature entirely in ex-bourbon casts, while the extra-matured range bottlings are transferred into casts that were previously used to mature other products such as wine, port or sherry in the process called finishing so they have a whole production line yeah. just for their finishing barrels yeah well i mean i guess you would but they have their own forest if that you they have their own forest they have their own that's forest amazing. in america yeah that's amazing i love it <laughs> so they had to come over and be like you know we're gonna make our own barrels we're gonna air them and let them age for two years we're then gonna lease them to heaven hill and jack daniels and then when they're done when they dump those and bottle that whiskey then the bourbon caskets sent overseas to scotland yeah so the the whole reason why they used the peat 
moss to smoke their barley to stop the germination so right. they could have the malt is because they didn't have a lot of forest wood to burn. Right, right. So Yeah, so right. that, that was the whole reason for that scotch has that ca- character to it in the first place. All right, we're going to do two at a time here with the uh, Glen Rangie. Yeah. The tenure, which Joe despises, is about $46 now. <laughs> which Ed um, and I actually kind of like. Um, <laughs> it's basically a delicious go-anywhere type of bottle made in their giraffe high stills aged 10 years in bourbon casks and um on the <laughs> nose you're looking for something very fruity and thick with oh, notes of lemon it's... nectarine and apple and some spice uh, i'm smelling all of that yeah yeah we did this on our original right. scotch episode without joe and we had a bottle for the following year's march madness interesting i don't like this as much as i liked it last year the, the taste is just okay just okay it's well, a little thin yeah 86 it, proof 86 proof so we've tasted some pretty intense scotches yeah that, that, that i think that's what it is yeah i think that whether you like the scotch or not the scotch beats up your you know taste buds taste pretty buds, good it's yeah. a very intense flavor and right now this is coming up very thin for me interesting because it's not really coming up thin for me in terms of alcohol presence no no uh, it's burning but flavor wise yeah i agree it is a little burning and i agree that the flavors are coming up weak right now yeah yeah I'm getting a lot of spice from the barley. I'm getting a lot of sweetness that's not very distinct. But that's about it. Yeah. It's so funny to taste this, having already tasted three pretty intense scotches that are really in your face, two of which Ed and I didn't really care for it. But this is coming up short now. Yeah. It's very, very mediocre. It's a lot of fire, not a lot of flavor. It's a little sweet. Um, I wonder what the monkey shoulder would do right now. I will say, our deal is made. I have traded this bottle away. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I mean. For my Balvenine double wood. Oh, no. This is still better than the double wood for sure. Well, no, no, no. I disagree with that. For me. For me. (laughs) So we're going to try the La Santa. I'm really. I mean, the color difference between the two of these. So at every corner of the world, the setting sun is magical. Dramatic. Dr. Bill. Now, Dr. Bill is their director of whiskey creation. All right. This whiskey is Dr. Bill's attempt to bottle the magic of sunset. It's distilled and then matured in bourbon and sherry casks for 12 years, transforming it into a mouth-watering odyssey, bursting with rich spiciness and sun-drenched sweetness. Mm. $64, and you're looking for plum and baking spices on the nose, supported by milk chocolate raisins. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Glen, Glen oh. Orangey, La Santa, this is my oh. go-to scotch. It's always on my bar. Oh. I have a bottle waiting to go before this is emptied. All right, so the color difference, the Glenmorangie original 10-year is basically yellow. It looks like Bushmills. And the La Santa is amber. It's funny. All the plum and the baking spices, the milk chocolate raisins, the caramel, toasty oak on the nose, the palate as a dash of tart raspberry. I taste almost all that. Honestly, I, chocolate I, raisin is an amazing taste profile because I would never have grabbed that out of the air. Right. But I absolutely but taste after, the chocolate and I absolutely it, yes. taste like a really rich, dark fruit. Are raisin you a smoky end to this? Mm. A smoky end? Like a finish? I mean, I'm smelling smoke. Mm. A very faint yeah. whiff of smoke. I'm, I'm smelling I'm it. I'm so disappointed in how I don't like this. And I wanted to like this one the most there is a little bit of smokiness on the end there is a little but it's, i'm not going to say this oh, is a smoky no it's, at all this is not it, a smoky to me scotch. it's not off-putting but i will say that i think i like the glen livet 18 a little better than this oh me too i'm really glad that everyone's tuning into our last scotch episode i really appreciate everyone <laughs> for coming out to this this has been great because i can't see how i'm going to sit through another hour of even worse scotches than these wow you're just so close-minded what is close i'm trying uh, scotch after scotch we told where have you been oh, this is my fourth Ed, fifth Ed, scotch Ed is a bourbon <laughs> drinker which is fine he I likes five he likes scotches his, on close he likes sweet he likes his sweet drinks I'm gonna yes t- I'm and gonna, how many have you liked i'm gonna one, one. I'm gonna, so i'm gonna tattoo fuck scotch on my chest and go out in the world <laughs> yeah fuck scott. yeah then you'll say fuck scott and i'll be like i knew it i didn't I, I, I didn't bring enough money for the a, for the h and you're not enjoying this no wow well, that that's amazing wow. so like i said i like the 18 year glenn livet better than this but i actually do like this I'm getting like almond cookie and stuff in it. Yes. Like, um, well, yes. The, I, I'll tell you, I want to taste the thing that's so bad. And I feel like the thing that can only disappoint me now. 
No, it, it, is, it is not going to I disappoint I feel like it can only right? hurt me. All right, so Total Wine has this for $53. There you go. That's where I got it. So, $53. $53. Wow. All right, so this is a steal this at is $53. It's, it's on my bar constantly. Where's my monkey shoulder at? So like, oh, I, wanna, I need to cry on my no, monkey shoulder. No monkey shoulder. I see shoulder. what you did there. Hold me closer, monkey shoulder. <laughs> All right, so... We're going to take a very quick break this time. This, quick, this episode real quick. that never ended. So, yeah. So, give us two <laughs> minutes. We'll be right back. Okay, so we're back, and Joe gave us friendly bartender pours <laughs> of the next two expressions, the very high-end expressions of Glenmorangie, and Ed is going to tell us a little bit more about both. Right. The uh, neck door, uh, which is $82, part of the regular line, and they have a very interesting master distiller there, you know, Dr. Bill. He said that- Dr. Bill. This is reminiscent of entering mm. a pastry shop for the first time, and it's mm. a moment of finding your senses deliciously overwhelmed, breathing in sweet scents, and wishing you could take a bite of every creamy, flaky treat you see. Wow. After its Asian American oak bourbon cast, along with other casts that held- Saturn sweet white wine. Mm. The outcome is like a silky dessert filled daydream of white chocolate swirled mm. with lemon cream. White chocolate. And cream Fuck caramel. white chocolate. Random belligerence. Fuck white chocolate edition. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ed. Almond croissants all balanced in a soft drumbeat of spice. Each sip is like sending your senses on a holiday to a French pastry shop. <laughs> wow. Almond croissants. It's funny you say that. And I'm going to France this summer. I've never been to France. I've, I, I've, I've never been, been to France. But you've gone to Europe. I've you've, been to New York, but I've been been never Europe. been to France. But I was in French Canada once. Canada? French Canada. Yep. No, that's That's how they say thing. it, I think. Yeah, I've been in Montreal. Yeah, because that's where the vampires live. Yeah. As we learned on the Caribou Crossing. Because that's where Sazerac was from. <laughs> right. No, no, that's not where they're from, but they well, own they, right, a lot right. of stuff there. Right. Well, I'm saying in Canada, that's where they're from. If you're looking for Sazerac in Canada, you go to well, Montreal. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Don't defend the vampires. No, no. <laughs> no, you're right. I got okay, you. so okay. this is around $82. And it's, um, oh, wow. So well, let's take a smell of this. I don't like the smell. I mean, I don't know what else. What, I mean, you're, they're saying I should smell lemon curd, yes. vanilla shortbread, followed by oak spice and gingerbread. Dried fruit follows a drizzle of runny honey. Now, I don't runny know how you honey. smell runny honey. Wait, but, runny honey? Yeah. No, but I absolutely Not, smell lemon yes. and gingerbread, absolutely. which which is really strange to smell both of those in the same whiskey. Mm. Ooh. I, I might have to drop some water in there and open up the flavors. <laughs> Wow, this is really nice. I would say this is my favorite scotch of the night. I'm still not tasting the baklava, and I love baklava. Mm, mm. I just said I think this is my favorite scotch of the night. No, no, I, I heard you, Ed, no, no, and, over, and I'm trying to the decide. Me, I mean, if that doesn't qualify as me being open the fuck minded, I want credit for that. Wow, goddammit. why are you so salty well, no, about I'm that? Not, I wasn't salty at all. Y'all stepped this way. You came at me hard. So I'm just saying that after tasting the fucking nectar <laughs> of the right. god. It is no, very. I'm not done yet. Ed, anyway. you're done when I say you're done. Fred, you're doing coming. it again. See, Joe, this is anymore. what I told you about Fred. Right. And yeah, he's getting too big for fucking britches. Ed's whiskey non scotch podcast. Let's go non scotch with the S C O T. Two T's. Two T's. The, the non scotch non-scot podcast. <laughs> Good luck editing this bitch. <laughs> It'll just be a free conscious form of me just talking now. So it's one of with guys. I think whiskey is something that I kind of like. And it, <laughs> right. So if it was just Ed on this podcast, it would be three hours of Ed talking. 
punctuated every four right. seconds by, I want to lick Siobhan's ass. <laughs> Siobhan does not look like she's in on that. No. no. She's got her hand over her face. She's on her phone. She's like, oh my God, why am I even here? Yeah, but she's looking at pics I sent her on her phone. That's why she's on her phone. <laughs> oh my God, dick pics. You yeah. do not send dick pics anymore, Ed. <laughs> no, I don't. Only of Dick Sargent from the Bewitch fame. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to the whiskey. Ed, you said that this was your favorite of all the whiskeys that we've had so to, far tonight. Absolutely, not tonight. Close. Yep, tonight. I just topped off some more of it to try it again, and I taste a little bit of the chocolate notes in it. I can definitely taste the Sauternes finish, which is adding a tremendous sweetness to the finish. This is really good. Mm-hmm. This is very close to the 18-year uh, uh, Glen Livet. Yep. Yeah. But better. It's sweeter. It's got a sweeter finish. It is sweeter. And, and that's why you like that sweet but taste mm-hmm. to it. Similar to the 18, it does have a dryness to the finish. It's dry, but it doesn't like suck all the no, moisture right. out of it. It's not as dry. And yeah. that was the Glenlivet. The, the 12? One. I think it was the 12, the 12. that was the really okay. super dry one. Yeah. I think the 18 one was the one we all pretty much agreed on until this one. Yeah. So as we move into the last expression of the night, the signet, this is what they say. As Dr. Bill, our free thinking director of whiskey creation, enjoyed a cup of his favorite Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee. Oh. The notion of signet first came to him. At once his mind filled with spiraling mocha flavors that he could not forget. Ooh. It would take him years to bring our unprecedented whiskey to life. But in its tiramisu tones and melting chocolate, you can taste his most delicious imaginings. Sydney begins with our precious chocolate malt spirits made just once a year in our giraffe high stills. Its espresso-like intensity fills the distillery with aromas more familiar in an Italian coffee bar. Over the years, we temper its power with rare and treasured casts. Bourbon for creaminess, sherry for sweetness, and the spice of virgin charred oak. All balanced by some of the oldest whiskey we own. Slower, Ed. Slower. The result? A velvet explosion of flavor. Bursts of bitter mocha, sizzling spice, (laughs) and waves of dark chocolate mellowed by a smooth butterscotch finish. Whiskey as you have never tasted before. Oh my God, open a window. (laughs) So while it carries no age statement, there are some elements of the distillery's oldest and rarest stock, ranging from 35 to 40 year old Highland single malt scotch in this bottle. Mm. Mm. The nose begins with chocolate raisins Mm -hmm. and sugared mixed peels. Toasted spices, bread and butter pudding, and golden syrup complement these aromas with a note of Augustura bitters lingering beneath. Is this your favorite scotch? Uh, It it could be. Could be. Would you buy this or two of the Abuna? (laughs) By Abelor. The Abuna. It's tough, isn't it? It is a very tough. Two you know what? Abelor Abunas or it, one of these. The smell of it actually reminds me of the Abuna. And again, it, it's, <sighs> Man, it's... smell is amazing. Now, as much as I did not like the first, really any of the noses tonight didn't wow me, but this one is definitely special. Sweet and dark fruits. This is the first time that I've smelled cherries on one of the scotches that we've had tonight. I'm not a coffee fan oh at all. I don't drink it, but that's the first flavor I get is coffee. In the taste. In the I mean, taste. Well, it says here that the backdrop of the palate is filled with tobacco leaves and freshly roasted espresso beans. Tobacco. And and that's exactly what you get when you taste that. Okay. The tobacco on the smell, it smells like a really fresh cigar. Yeah, so let's... That mm, sweetness. Yeah, like when you're like smell... Like there is a sweetness to yeah, when you smell the an that, unlit cigar. That earthy sweetness of a, c- of a fresh cigar. Let's taste it, okay. shall we, Scott? Well, yes. I, I, I've already tasted it. We know. I watched you, but you're, you're, you've already had it. This is our first time. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. The chocolate it, is immediate. It is not anything what you would expect when you're smelling this on the nose. Oh, my God. It's dark cocoa powder yes, on the palate oh immediately. God, immediate. This is probably one of the top five whiskeys I've ever drank. This is, this is tremendous. This is a... I mean, why can't scotch be like this for me on a regular basis? Like, Wait. why does it have to be two hundred and twenty dollars a bottle? Ed, so what was the difference in the preparation between the nectar yeah, like, dork? What, what makes this a two hundred twenty dollar bottle? Yeah, repeat that again for us. Right. Well, so he begins with a chocolate malt spirit. Okay? Oh, so it's chocolate malted barley. Got you. Okay? Got you. They put it into bourbon casks, sherry okay. casks. Okay. 
and then the spice of a virgin charred cast. So like a brand new cast again. Yeah. Yeah. Lots to mention. Some of this whiskey here is 35 to 40 years old. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So I mean, fuck. Jesus. So think about this. I was 23 years of age. Edge was still able to see his penis then. Oh. Wow. Wow. Shit. Now, be- <laughs> because I like you, Joe, I didn't say now only your wife sees it. Or, oh, like, there's so many comebacks. Your mom like, said, said now only your, your mom, mom sees now it. You're in a mom's but, season? but that's but, why I felt right, free right, to say right, that because right, I wouldn't I, say I, any I, of that. I'm sure that's right. going to be edited. I wouldn't no, say that. No, no, that's going to be kept in. Ed Shade is always kept in because <laughs> I'm the editor. Right. So this is extraordinary. Really, this is incredible. This does actually remind me very much of the Abuna. I don't see that. I don't see a direct comparison. Oh, well, maybe we should pour some Abuna. All right, get the Abuna bottle. God, I just went back and forth between both of them, and they're both really freaking good scotch. That's close, man. The Abuna is a little bit more Uh, floral. Yeah, much more, more. floral. I yeah. get I got more of that burning sensation on my tongue. I do get the, the chocolate though, Scott. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's Whoa. less chocolatey than Chocolate. the signet. Yeah. I mean, I really love the signet. I love it. I just said and I think it might be a top five whiskey of my life. Like, yeah. Actually, I, I really enjoy that you saying that it's top five whiskeys. All time. Yeah. It's a, it's, you it's know, tremendous. You know that this is a crafted whiskey that hours and hours of time and years and years have gone into. I was excited to bring this to yeah. you guys yeah, yeah, tonight. Yeah. And that's why we did this last. Because we knew that this was special just the way you were talking it up and the way it was produced. But right. definitely a spicy cocoa. Right. So. Woo. Wow. This is amazing. So I, love I it. think to sum up real quick. Yeah. What we've demonstrated here is the extension of a brand. So you go to Glen Marangi and you have the tenure and you're like, this is pretty good. This yeah, is your first it's, do it. it's okay. Well, you did it though, Joe. Your first one was the tenure. And then you said, you know what? I think I can do better than this. And then Joe went out and found the La Santa. Yeah, and then La Santa, my right. go to Scotch. Right. And then he got the nectar as a present. It's $82 or so. It's definitely good. I said it was my favorite of the night before the signet. The signet blows it out of the water. <laughs> and then the signet, which is a one of a kind expression of Scotch which I doubt will be duplicated. It's only drank on special occasions, wow. and this is a special occasion, my yes. first night. Yeah, first night podcast. on the podcast. First, it should have been a year ago. Right. Like should have been. I know. Months. Let's do a toast with the last of my signet. <laughs> That's your signet? <laughs> He's trying to <laughs> undercut me. And- I tried to toast him so hard that it would tip his glass into mine, <laughs> and I could get more signet. So it's um, delicious. It's I want to really thank good. Joe for bringing... Six whiskeys, setting a personal guest record for the amount of whiskeys brought on one episode, beating Anders on the Japanese episode where he brought the two main whiskeys we featured, by the way, that day. Yes. Which is the first time that it ever happened before. Right. Anders says, I was not trying to show you up. I don't know. Anders would appreciate that was not the purposely. I Anders, I've listened to you many times on this podcast. I know you got a jacket. <laughs> I'm not even right. near a jacket. Right. Right. Anders right. is like, you mad far from a jacket, bro. So, but <laughs> You're four episodes away from a but jacket. I tell you right now, Anders was jealous not to be here for seven scotches he's like wait we had seven scotches and i didn't get any of them (laughs) and and the signet was on board so i want to thank joe for bringing those out to me and the toast to him absolutely his generosity thank you joe so much i want to thank ed and scott for allowing me on here tonight i truly enjoyed myself well you're very well you're a tremendous guest and like i said you set the record for most whiskeys brought on the podcast yeah and we'll have a plaque made up for you Uh, that's already i i think ed this counts as actually two appearances (laughs) on the the podcast right this is a double jacket appearance so you only have to have three more Jacket. I'm going to get a jacket in oh my God. one of these next three or four years. We got to get a 46 long, though. That's the problem. Or yeah, he's very tall. <laughs> he's taller than I am. It, it, right. That's saying something. Really, 6'5? Six 6'5. Five? Six six, five. Yeah. 6'5. Six it's got 6'3 six three and a six half. 6'3. 6'3. Six three. Oh, yeah. a little guy. Little guy. <laughs> That's right. So listen, everybody, we had seven great scotches tonight. I didn't do bad. I hated four of them. But hey, listen. Okay. Three were okay. There's nothing bad about right. that, Ed. Right. All right. So for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, I'm Ed. I'm Scott. I am Joe. Try something different if you want. And if you got the deep pockets, get the signet when it comes out. It's special. Later.
If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out our next episode, which is way better than this one. Oh, yeah. Also, follow and like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash whiskey tangent. And follow us on Twitter at whiskey tangent. You can follow me personally at that whiskey guy. And follow Scott at Giant Cup of Awesome, spelled A-W-S-U-M, just to be annoying. Hey! You can email us any questions, comments, or love at whiskeytangent at gmail.com. And of course, you can find us always at our podcast website, whiskeytangent.podbean.com.